Yeah. I, Good morning. Uh, I'm Eileen Boken, president of SPEAK, which is Sunset Parkside Education Action Committee. Uh, SPEAK has been an active voice here in the neighborhood for over 40 years. We are active in a wide range of issues, of neighborhood issues. SPEAK is excited to be a co-sponsor of this event. I'm also the vice president of the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods, another co-sponsor of this event. Uh, SPEAK is a charter member of the coalition. The coalition has been active in citywide issues for over 40 years. On behalf of the coalition's president, George Wooding, uh, welcome to the District 4 Candidate Forum. In 2002, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. In 1920, as women won the right to vote, the League of Women Voters was founded by Carrie Chapman Catt. On behalf of SPEAK and the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods, I would like to express our appreciation to the League of Women Voters for 98 years of advocacy. I would also like to thank St. Ignatius for hosting this event. Working with St. Ignatius and the League of Women Voters has been an incredible experience. I would also like, like to thank SFGovTV for recording this event and bringing it to a wider audience. They have promised to make me look really good in this video. <laughs> I would like to thank the candidates for making the commitment to be here today. And finally, I would like to thank our neighbors, family, friends, district merchants, and many others who have made the commitment to be here today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Candidate Forum for the Board of, Supervisors, Dist Board of Supervisors District 4 for San Francisco. My name is Leah Edwards. I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan but political organization that is dedicated to promoting active and informed participation in government. The League works to ensure that all voters have access to nonpartisan, unbiased information so that they are prepared to make their own choices on Election Day. We put on free forums such as this. We produce a pro and con guide, which is a nonpartisan guide to all the ballot propositions. And we partner with SFGovTV to produce educational segments that explain candidates' platforms and discuss local ballot measures. The League of Women Voters never supports or opposes candidates, but we do take positions on issues. If you want to see, uh, get more information, our website is lwvsf.org. I want to thank SFGovTV so much for being here today and for recording this forum, and to thank our co-sponsors for the forum, Sunset Parkside Education Action Committee and Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods. I am now very pleased to introduce Maxine Anderson, who will be the moderator today. Maxine was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and attended the University of Illinois Chopin-Urbana, where she earned a BA in history. After graduation, she worked in the insurance industry in the Chicago area before transitioning to San Francisco. She continued to work in the industry until she had the opportunity to help develop and manage claims functions for the city's attorney's office of San Francisco, of the city of Oakland. She retired after working in the city of San Francisco uh, for the city's attorney's office and became very involved with the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. She previously served as the chair of our advocacy committee and participated in the creation of another nonpartisan organization, San Francisco De for Democracy, where she served as vice president for two terms. We are honored to welcome Maxine Anderson. Good morning, everybody. These lights are really bright up here. And I have to tell you, if I'm looking cool because my glasses go to shades, it's because they do that on their own, not because I was trying to give any kind of look or anything. But again, thank you so much for being here today. Today, you will be hearing from the candidates to represent District 4 on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. The candidates will have a chance to present their views um, on issues affecting the city and your district and to answer your questions about those issues. To submit questions for the candidates, look for a volunteer, I can't see you, but I know you're out there, who will be handing out index cards. We will collect all questions by 11 a.m. 
I wish to remind you of our ground rules. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was loud enough. You want me to start over or can I go from here? Okay. Um, I want to re um, remind you of our ground rules here. No literature, campaign signs, or buttons may be distributed or posted inside this meeting room. This is a totally nonpartisan um, event. Candidates and their supporters are expected to be respectful of other candidates and the audience and to help maintain quiet during the forum. Candidates are asked to make no personal attacks on other individuals. Here are the procedures for the forum. Each candidate will have one minute to answer questions you in the audience submit, as well as questions that have been submitted in advance. All candidates will answer each question. Any rebuttals may be included in the candidate's closing statement, which will be one minute. The timekeepers, excuse me, in the first row, could you hold it? hold up your hands and your cards, will hold up yellow cards to signify to the candidates that they have 15 seconds remaining and will hold up a red card when it's time to stop. Every aspect of the forum will be equally fair to all candidates. You have many important decisions to make on November 6th. Today's forum will give you an opportunity to be heard. Now let's begin. Thank you, first of all, saying thank you to the candidates who stood up to um, hope to represent you in your district. They are thank yous to Luann Bassan, yes. did I get that correct? Adam Kim, Gordon Marr, Trevor McNeil, Mike Murphy, Tuan Nguyen, did I get that? It's Win, W I N. That's Nguyen. how you pronounce it. Okay, Win, and Art Tom, I want to get it right for attending today's forum, okay? So we're gonna start off, we're gonna begin, I guess is the best way to put it. So, I have some questions here. Again, please, if you have questions that you wanna ask, please write them down and give them to the volunteers who will be up and down the aisles uh, looking for your questions. So the first question, did you hear that part about fill out the card and give it to the volunteers? Thank you. I'm gonna get this right, but it's early Saturday morning. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> okay, we're gonna start off with Ms. Bassan. And again, the questions will be asked in alphabetical order. The first question, over the last five years, in your opinion, have elected officials moved the city in the right direction or the wrong direction, and, and why do you feel the way you feel? My opinion is that the city officials have not. Thank you. My opinion is that the city officials have not moved our city in the right direction at all. I think that they have moved the city to a disastrous precipice. We are bordering on chaos. Why? We don't need drug injection sites. We don't need an increase in the needle exchange program. We know that San Francisco is handing out 400,000 needles a month, but only getting back 150,000 used needles. These policies are not good for San Francisco. In addition, the focus on increasing housing density and building along transit corridor, corridors is again misguided. Thank you. And Mr. Kim? Can I take this? All right. Um, I will also say that we haven't exactly been moving in the right direction. Um, there have definitely been uh, good advances uh, made by certain supervisors and certain uh, city agencies. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we still have a crisis of homelessness and affordable housing. Um, and we just keep giving away uh, development deals and tax incentives to these large corporations. And it's, it's hurting the people. 
and it's hurting the communities. And you know, we can't. That's not a sustainable uh, model. Uh, eventually, we're just going to become a city for the super rich, and uh, we'll have this giant wealth gap that um, you know all our uh, marginalized communities will be alienated and uh, unable to live uh, in in the city that's basically alienated them. Thank you very much, Mr. Marr. Yeah. Um, well, I think we all know that over the past decade, actually, our city's been going through a pretty unprecedented um, tech-driven economic development boom, and that's created a lot of exciting benefits and, 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 and brought a lot to the city, but it's also created a lot of big challenges, um, I, I think as, as Adam and, and Luann had, had mentioned. And I, I, don't, I feel like the, our, our city leaders haven't done a very good job of addressing the challenges that, that have been created by this unprecedented development boom, particularly the um, building housing that's affordable you know, for, for working families and, 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 and everyone that, that can't afford market rate housing in the city. Um, also, you know, there's the growing homeless, homeless popu population and homeless crisis that really hasn't been addressed in, in a significant way. Um, and then there's also been growing public safety issues, particularly property crime. So I think these are, are big, big citywide problems that also affect us out here in the Sunset District that um, we need stronger leadership um, at City Hall to really address in bolder and, and more strategic ways. Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil. I would definitely agree that we do need stronger leadership. And I mean, the affordability crisis, the crisis on our streets, and sort of the, the ongoing family flight and difficulties uh, the San Francisco faces make it clear that the last five years have not worked. Uh, however, I do also think that it's, uh, <laughs> maybe not for lack of trying, I mean, our, our leadership does have innovative ideas. Our leadership does stand up to Donald Trump's agenda. Our leadership does try their best, but what I think they're doing is they're focusing on the minute-by-minute -minute problems. They're pulling bodies out of the river without going upstream to see where they came from in general. And that's sort of one of the reasons that I'm running for supervisors. I'm really interested in long-term sustainable policies, not just putting out this fire, putting out this fire, coming up with this feel-good measure, but really thinking, what can we do long-term, not just to manage homelessness, but to end homelessness? What can we do long-term, not just to help prevent displacement, but to help families thrive and actually have a, a city that people can afford to live in. Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy? Yeah, San Francisco's a boom-bust town, as many of you know. And we're in, we're in tech, tech V2 at this point. This has been the most significant contributor to the, uh, many of the problems that the city faces at this time. Um, city leadership will point to, will, will play dog whistle politics all day long, while you and I both know that it's the tech real estate cabal that really rules City Hall. And that's, they respond to their big money donors, not to regular San Franciscans. Uh, the stats are clear, 60,000 people in, 50,000 people out. This is from our planning department every year. This is extremely disruptive to our communities. We need stable, strong communities and strong leadership in those communities who comes from outside of the tech real estate cabal in order to fight the problems that we have here. Um, evictions and displacements citywide. Many of our, we've lost many neighbors and friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Yes, uh, we're very much fighting for the soul of the city. Um, the city's under attack, and it's under attack by the tech sector and the tech community. Um, the San Francisco that the tourists come here to go and visit is no longer the San Francisco that we have today. It's a divided city in so many different ways, uh, not to mention the issues that we deal with specifically just to the Sunset District. Um, you're having large developers come in, and there isn't enough market rate housing out there. Uh, the tech community is polarizing. There isn't enough uh, diversified fields out there. Our artists, community, our musicians, they can't afford to live here anymore. And quite honestly, we don't have any long-term plans, and that's unfortunate. My friends, um, whether they're older or younger, they're living paycheck to paycheck. And we have a moderate and, a device and, and progressive division going on in City Hall. I plan to change that as an independent Democrat, a leader in the Thank sunset that, that the sunset deserves. Thank you very much. And Mr. Tom? 
Thank you. In the last five years, and even in the last 10 years, we have not been going in the right direction. That's witnessed by more families leaving San Francisco, and as people alluded to, we want to have a long-term solution, not just a quick legislative knee-jerk reaction. On the issue of homelessness, it's not just San Francisco's problem. We cannot solve it uh, without looking at the rest of the region and the rest of the state. We're putting it too much on the backs of homeowners paying property taxes, and we have to share that with other parts of the region. We want to see families stay here in the sunset and the parkside, so we need to switch our emphasis onto services that the families out here need. Preschool, after school, senior care. These are things that, that we need here in the neighborhood. I want to see Muni improved so that we can rely on our public transportation and public safety increased so that people feel safe in their homes and neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question, we're going to um, go to housing because that's an issue that's, as you all know, is uh, always talked about in the city of San Francisco. And so I'm going to condense these two questions into one, and we're going to start with Mr. Kim. And it's how do you feel about building more density housing? And what is your view on homeowners renting out in-law units? Do you think current policies help at all on that? All right. Um, so housing density, I, I don't believe in building for the sake of building. We, we're not going to build our way out of uh, the affordability crisis. Uh, and we need to assess each site uh, individually to find out how uh, the community feels about uh, the particular development and how it will serve the community. Uh, in terms of in-laws and other um, you know, ADUs, I feel um, there is some streamlining that could occur. Uh, right now, um, because we're kind of packed to the gills with uh, housing without, and we can't develop more without destroying uh, existing property, um, it's important to find a way for homeowners to uh, increase uh, what housing is available uh, given what they have uh, on hand. Thank you very much. Mr. Marr? Um, I moved, <clears throat> I moved, my wife and I moved to the Sunset District and bought our home here 13 years ago to raise our daughter. And I think like most, most, most of my neighbors, we value the, the sort of quiet, almost suburban, suburban feel out here in the Sunset District. Um, but, but also, you know, I think we will all recognize that we, we need to expand housing, um, especially for working families and for everyone that, that the current housing market doesn't serve in our city. Um, I do think there's ways for us to, to do that in the Sunset District that, that is appropriate for the character of our neighborhood. Um, I think um, replicating the educator housing project that's going up right now on, on 43rd and Judah and other pu publicly owned sites in the Sunset and on the West Side is a good strategy. I also, I do support um, expanding accessory dwelling units and in-law units um, in sort of a careful and, and way that, that would mitigate um, traffic, ex excessive traffic congestion and parking congestion in our neighborhoods. Um, but, but I do want to say that I'm, I think the bigger issue right now and the threat to the Sunset and the West Side is, is the growing call by big developers and other forces to um, upzone the Sunset and build um, high-rise luxury housing out here, and I would stand Thank up you. to that. Very thank, much. Thank you very much. And Mr. McNeil? So um, on my phone, I've got a little picture of, uh, sure. Um, I carry around a little photo of uh, my house uh, 80 years ago when it didn't exist. It was a sand dune. And I'm really glad that someone built that because now my family has a place to live. And so when it comes to density, what I, the way I think about it, I also don't want skyscrapers in the sunset. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I want to build more housing in a, in a way that preserves neighborhood character, but also invites more people. When I was born in, in San Francisco, the, the population has grown 4,300 on average every year, boom or bust. Um, and I'm partly responsible for that because I've got three kids under four. I'm, I'm part of the creating more San Franciscans. And so when I think about this issue about density, I think about neighborhood character, but I also think about the decision to build the home that I'm raising my family in now, 80 years ago. I'm thinking about this in terms of where are my children going to live? 
Where, how are, is San Francisco going to grow in a way that is inclusionary, protects people who are already here, and makes a city that we can love in and live in? Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy? Yeah, I, I wish to provide an antidote to the Yimby Kool-Aid that's been passed around. Um, I believe that the affordable housing crisis as it's characterized is a lie. Um, what has happened is we've had, uh, we've had tech, we've had a tech real estate cabal, which, is, which has increased the number of, of uh, high wage residents of uh, San Francisco. This is gentrification at its, at its base. When you take people who have spent their lives, um, generations perhaps, in a particular area, making that area livable for them and replace them with people who make more money. Of course, it fills the city's coffers, but it does nothing except destroy communities. Um, what, I, what I would propose is, in terms of density, is building along, building along strictly along the train routes in the sunset to four stories, which is the current zoning code. It's, it's greed that evicts us from the homes that we have built, and we should say no to that sort of greed. Thank you very much. Mr. Wynn? Yeah, we, we have to keep housing affordable in the Sunset District. In particular, young families can't afford to live here anymore. They try to move out here, start a family, and quite frankly, you end up single because you can't raise a family. You, you have to raise dogs and, and walk them, right? Um, but supply heavily out, outweighs demand uh, in San Francisco. Um, and... You know, if you live in the, in the Sunset District, you realize homes are Henry Doger homes and, and Rousseau homes. And they're trying to have a cookie cutter approach for all the different districts. You can't do that. You have to look at zoning in different ways and market rate housing. And yes, I do agree that you should build responsibly um, in uh, merchant and traffic corridors with the input of residents. But I also opposed SB 827, which Scott Weiner um, uh, proposed, and that is to build more than five stories, and I don't think that's the answer in the Sunset District. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? I think that, of course, everyone wants more housing. There are some workable solutions to that, besides just increasing density, because when we increase density, we have to say what kind of density. I'd like to see more two and three bedroom homes rather than the studios and one bedrooms that the developers have been talking about because this is a family neighborhood. I'd also like to consider parking. Right now the planning code calls for 0.25 of a parking space for each unit. I need to drive more than a quarter of a car when I take my kids around town. Um, so that needs to be considered for the neighborhood. Also, the water infrastructure here is not adequate in case there's a, a disaster. So we have to consider that. And we also, people don't realize there's sandy soil and we know the Millennium Tower is sinking. We have to consider how, how high we can build out here. It's not like the rest of the city. Um, the other solution is to make it easier for people to rent out their in-laws so that they could take it back down the road if they wanted their kids to move back in. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Bassan? Thank you. Density has two parts, people density and actual building density. And I don't favor increasing building density in the sunset for a number of reasons. First of all, the issue is really about supply and demand. There is far more demand than there is supply. But that's really a lie because there are estimated to be at least 40,000 units being held off market by landlords who are afraid to rent to tenants all across San Francisco. And in the Sunset District, it's estimated to be about 10 to 15,000 units. So I say look at existing supply before we build. And I don't think that building on transit corridors is a great idea for the simple reason that while Noriega Street is a transit corridor today and could be built up under these grand plans, next year it could be Moraga Street. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question, we're going to start with Mr. Marr, and I'm going to, again, compound the question. Um, 
one of the questions was District uh, 4 is primarily residential, um, in which many families try to raise uh, their children. Um, how do you see, what's your vision for improving the life for all of District 4's youth from their early years to transition age youth? And could you think of this in terms of public safety and reducing crime and also cleaning the streets, cleaning up Sunset? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Um, well, actually, we, we moved to the Sunset District, my wife and I, mainly to raise our daughter here, and, and she's now in eighth grade at Hoover Middle School. And, and so, like, again, like many of our neighbors, you know, we, we, we value the, the family-friendly environment of the Sunset District um, and the good schools that we have, you know, the playgrounds and the parks. Um, but, um, you know, having said that and go, getting to the question, there, it, there is a lot more that we could do to make the Sunset District family friendly and, and, and a better environment for our young people to grow up in. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm really committed to is expanding services for in the, directly in the neighborhood, you know, both for children and youth, but also seniors and families. There, there's, there's really a lack of, of, of neighborhood-based services here in the Sunset compared to other, other districts. And we, and we see that, um, you know, a lot of Sunset residents actually go out of the neighborhood to access services. So I, and as a, as a nonprofit executive director in San Francisco for over 25 years, I'm very committed to um, developing more neighborhood-based services for youth, children, and everyone in the Sunset. Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil? So, I mean, I care deeply about families, not just because I have one, um, but I'm a public school teacher by day. And so all of these, uh, my background really I look at public policy through the lens of a family, and that's not to the exclusion of, of folks who don't have a family or retirees. I think that if you want safe streets, and I used to represent District 4 on the Pedestrian Safe Safety Advisory Committee, those streets have to be safe for kids to be able to walk. If you want great parks, I currently sit on the Parks Recreation Advisory Committee, you want, great parks aren't just for kids, they're for everyone, it's about community building. So I think looking at public policy through the lens of is this going to help families thrive and stay in San Francisco is actually a, a way that helps us all. Um, one thing specifically that I'm really ex interested in doing as a supervisor is making the, the Office of Supervisors sort of a one-stop shop for people cu curious about uh, daycare, about the public school system. You can call the, your uh, public school commissioner or the school board, but it, it's too big. You're not going to have that sort of personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection. And so I would like to make the Office of District Supervisor a one-stop shop for those sort of child-rearing and thriving needs. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Murphy? I teach uh, preschool, uh, SFUSD. I'm an eco-literacy instructor for the district. Uh, I, I do care deeply about our, our youth, and I've seen our, our enrollments dropping. In fact, San Francisco, we have, this, we have the smallest population of youth of any major city in the country. The reason for this, again, is the, uh, is the destabilization of our neighborhoods. Um, I would like to see a vacancy tax on the books. I would like to see a tax on out-of-town ownership of our properties. We need to take away the, uh, the housing stock that could be used by families, take it, take it away from the real estate investment trusts and the, and, the corporate and the corporate landlords, take ownership of that, stabilize our neighborhoods. And I need to, we need to have safe environment for our children to play in. I was a principal of the, uh, of the uh, action to protect Golden Gate Park from toxic turf. Um, that's a hazard. There, our drinking water is now being polluted by toxic toxins in our groundwater. We need a strong legislator who will stand up to that. Thank you very much. Mr. Wynn? I support having neighborhood schools. Could you move the microphone here? Sure. I support having neighborhood schools for our neighborhood kids. In particular, I'm, I'm not supportive of, of having a lottery system, making it more difficult for our middle class families to thrive and our kids traveling all across the city to just get a, a, a good public education. Uh, I am proud of the parks um, in the Sunset District. Um, I've done my part as a youth coordinator uh, to serve the youth at Holy Name um, for years, actually 14 years, I hosted a Friday night basketball um, session over at Holy Name where high school sc students and college students are able to play basketball and, and stay off the streets. Um, I was also a high school coordinator for the Department of Elections. Um, I'm proud to say that I was the co-chair for the Ortega Branch Library campaign 
back in 2010. We rebuilt this library over here, and um, it supports the children, and uh, it, it makes the sunset better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? I also have a family here. They were born in the house that they live in in the sunset today, and we're vested in trying to make it better for everyone. We know that the schools are not really under the, uh, out, it's out of our hands for the supervisors. It's controlled a lot by the state of California. But the after school and before school programs is what I would like to see. Right now, the uh, preschool program considers age four and age five. I would like to see it expanded to age two and three. For the after school programs, especially with two working parents like myself and my wife, we need after school programs that take care of kids that are educational and enriching and can watch kids till six o'clock when parents come home for work. Um, I started the Friends of West Sunset Playground, which took a dilapidated, unused, and un unsafe and unclean park. And we started selling cookies for a dollar. We ended up raising 1.5 million and dedicated the park back to the city of San Francisco. So that's something that can be used by families. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bassan. Thank you. First, I would like to echo Mr. Wynn's comments about having neighborhood schools for neighborhood children. I think that's incredibly important for them. Thank you. Second, I would suggest that having libraries that have open hours seven days a week and all day long would be a tremendous improvement for the children in our neighborhood. And in terms of public safety for our children, I strongly suggest that the Sunset District not have any cannabis dispensaries in the borders of the district, not have any illegal drug injection sites in the borders of its district, and not have any navigation centers in the borders of its district. This is what's going to keep the character and the safety of the sunset intact. And we want that for our current residents and for our children. Thank you very much. And Mr. Kim? Uh, so the sunset is definitely very residential and um, it has historically been very family friendly, although the uptick in crime has put that in question. Um, but, you know, like Ms. Murphy has said, uh, we have a lot of investors that are holding on to property and keeping it vacant, trying to make, any, make a quick buck off of them, uh, renting them out for a weekend or a month at a time. So we have uh, this constantly shifting uh, you know, tourist base and how are we going to be able to uh, keep an eye on, like make sure we have a consistent uh, neighborhood if we have new neighbors all the time. Uh, and so we need to make these uh, vacant units actual apartments so that people and families can live in them. And uh, I'm lucky to live right by Ortega Library, but uh, we need more facilities like that in the city. We need, um, in, in our district, we need um, more libraries and we don't even have a CCSF campus uh, in our neighborhood and that's something that I would love to push for. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go on to the next question which deals with transportation and we're going to start with Mr. McNeil. And the question is, what is your view on the El Terravel Rapid Project and other public transportation <coughs> initiatives in the city? So, um, like I said, I was, I was representing um, District 4. Katie Tang appointed me to the Pedestrian Safety Advisory Committee. And so I went to all of those outreach meetings with MTA about the L. And uh, no matter what the uh, technocrats will tell you about the efficiencies or the pedestrian safety improvements, which are there and important, it was a colossal failure on a uh, public outreach uh, front. Uh, nobody is happy about the improvements along the L. And I think that one of the things that's really important is to have more oversight at MTA. Um, but the other thing that's really important is to have uh, somebody in the Board of Supervisors who really knows the neighborhood, who can help uh, guide uh, public transportation 
uh, improvements and projects in a way that shows that, that they know the neighborhood, right? Like, I'm thinking about like, when, when the L turns on to uh, Noriega out by the water, there's no stoplight there. And so the L can actually get sort of hung up uh, on just sort of normal traffic patterns. We have to, there are simple, easy ways that we can improve public transportation in the sunset if you're from the sunset and you know the sunset and you know how, the, how to work it with City Hall. Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy? Yeah, the uh, SFMTA's process, public process, has been heavy-handed um, and phony. As, as supervisor, what I would like to do is, um, is set up a community advisory boards throughout the sunset and take control of that process. Um, a lot of people are checked out of politics in the sunset completely because we've been abandoned to city hall politics for decades. Um, as an independent, Supervisor, I would, I would invite participatory democracy. I would like to hear my neighbors, not just listen to them, um, and give lip service. The El Terraval project hurt local businesses. Local businesses were also hurt by another crazy, heavy-handed project on Irving Street, which disrupted uh, holiday store traffic and put, put one business I know of out of business. So we need to really take control of the public process. And we need a, we need a hard-nosed hard legislator to do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Wynn? I think it's important that we continue to challenge our government uh, to be leaders in public and alternative transportation. The city always seems plagued with constant traffic congestion and poor urban planning. If we look at SFMTA, there should be more than enough of a budget to actually be functioning. That's not happening, especially out in the Sunset District where families and, and workers commute an hour a day. You might as well work in Palo Alto if that's the case um, to try to make it down there and make it home for dinner. Um, it's, SFMTA has bungled its rail systems. Um, the Twin Peaks Tunnel um, opening surprisingly was opened on time. Um, we're a world-class city uh, with a lack of scope and vision. Uh, this agency doesn't possess that. Um, if I were supervisor, I would actually ask that Ed Reiskin would step down. Um, he's been given ample opportunity to, to serve us, and he hasn't done that the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? I used to work on the tax commission, which is now part of MTA. And when everything folded into the MTA, we lost control of a lot of our transportation issues. What I would do is I would call for an independent audit of the MTA, and we can specifically say of the El Terravel or the N Judah. I'm an auditor with the city right now, so I understand the effect that an independent audit can have. It causes people to be accountable, it quantifies the performance, and brings up the level of efficiency. So we need to have accountability for MTA to the public, and I would make sure that that happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bassan? Thank you. I agree with Mr. Tom that when MTA was created as a merger between the Department of Parking and Traffic and Muni, it was a colossal failure. And I think that it should be split up again and it should go back to the way it was, with the Department of Parking and Traffic as one entity dealing with traffic, and Muni as a separate entity dealing with what it needs to deal with, which is the movement of people. The emphasis that MTA has put on shaving off nine seconds on a trip is ridiculous. Everybody knows that the streets in San Francisco are so congested with all kinds of vehicles that nine seconds isn't going to make a difference. They should be focusing on service to the constituents. Instead of taking away stops, they should be adding stops. It used to be their goal that every household could reach a muni stop in two blocks. We don't have that anymore. We need to bring that back. Thank you very much. Mr. Kim? So the SFMTA, uh, like a lot of city agencies, have uh, created this habit of making decisions uh, before gathering community input, approving them, and then letting us know after they've been made. 
Um, and the L Terrible is no exception to that. Uh, they've been stunting, like uh, making decisions based on these outdated studies um, and removing stops to uh, increase the speed of VL. Uh, meanwhile, we have uh, the elderly and disabled who are unable to find a stop close to them because they've been removing them. Uh, and then, you know, we've been removing parking spots that's hurting small businesses. You know, all, all these decisions being made and it's all under the guise of some kind of solution, but that solution's hurting so many other people. And we had a proposition a few years ago to actually make SFMTA Board of Directors um, not all appointed by the mayor, but have some appointed by the Board of Supervisors. I would like to see that come back and maybe even have some of those positions uh, elected positions. Thank you very much. And Mr. Marr? Um, I agree with all of my um, colleagues' um, critique of the, ch the changes to the El Terrabel and the poor public process that M SFMTA and Supervisor Tang's office sort of um, rolled out for our neighborhoods. But I would just add that I ride the El Terrabel every day. Um, I'm a commuter. I work downtown in Civic Center. And um, many of those days, um, I when I'm coming home, um, the, I have to wait for multiple cars to be able to squeeze in. Um, and, and often I'll have to take take a, uh, a car from Civic Center down to Embarcadero to get on a car to, to be able to get, get back home. Um, and we're the technology capital of the world now, and it, it still takes an hour to get by train um, from the sunset to downtown um, if it doesn't break down along the way. So um, we're one of the wealthiest, most creative cities in the world, and yet thousands of serv service hours are missed every month by MTA. We deserve a world-class transit system for our world-class city, and we, we deserve more frequent service um, trans more frequent services for commuters and tra trains with two-car minimum during peak hours, and we deserve to end switchbacks on the El Tarabel and the end Judah. Thank you very much. Okay, our next question, we're going to start with um, Mr. Murphy, and um, it should be McNeil, shouldn't it? I just went. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, with Mr. Murphy, but we're going to switch to the issue of drugs and their use in the city, because that's been one of the things that's been in the news a lot and on TV. And the question is, what can we do to address the public drug use in San Francisco? And give us your opinion on safe injection sites. And to bring it locally to District 4, how do you feel about retail and medicinal, medicinal cannabis being available in the sunset? I guess the, uh, the way, the, the place to start is, uh, I've had a carefully articulated position on, uh, on corporate weed um, since mar marijuana dispensaries in the, uh, in the sunset, since I filed my paperwork in March. Um, Adam and I, Adam Kim and I actually were on the ballot, would have been on the ballot prior to uh, Katie Tang's uh, departure. And the, uh, the rest of the uh, candidates you see here luckily stepped up um, later on, in order to give us a nice round of choices for uh, for supervisor, uh, my position on on marijuana is we don't need any dispensaries in the sunset. We don't need any. The reason we don't need any is because you can get it delivered to your door. the the uh, The city has totally bungled the uh, the marijuana legislation. It's ridiculous. I mean, it, it was it's been legal, but just now we're starting to figure out like how we can tax it and profit off it, use it as an ATM machine. Um, we need legislators who, who are more future focused. And I'd encourage you to choose three of this Thank group. You. Thank you very much. Mr. Nguyen? Yeah, recreational cannabis is legal as of this year. I accept that. Do I agree that, that we should have an apothecarium out on Noriega? That's up for the community to decide, quite frankly. It's supposed to have, you're supposed to ha not have a dispensary 600 feet away from a school or a church or a community in, the, in, in that aspect. So, so the public has, has spoken in that, that regard. Um, I look at, at um, also the issue of alcohol really affecting our children. I mean, we're talking about that war on drugs. I think alcohol is a little bit more important in, in terms of addressing and educating in that capacity. Um, regards to, uh, to navigation centers, I don't support a navigation center in the Sunset District. Um, I don't believe that the, the residents feel that it's appropriate to have that. 
the navigation centers outside of the sunset and downtown um, aren't <laughs> working in particular as well. Um, I've also opposed Spark um, down in the Lower Haight when I was the community engagement director. Thank you. At Spark, uh, against Spark. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? We know that marijuana has been made legal in California, but that doesn't mean that we can't have some oversight in our community. I would like to make sure that uh, uh, any place that's going to open here does not have any crime committed, either inside or outside the place, and that there's no possibility of selling it to children. Um, more than that, the injection sites and navigation centers seems to be much more of a serious problem than the cannabis, and we don't need those in the Sunset District. I would rather see the resources spent on after-school programs and education. Um, so as far as that goes, I want to make sure that we don't have navigation and uh, needle exchanges in the Sunset District. That would help us not have any more drug use out here. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bassan? The question is, we got... Okay, thank you. The question is regarding the use of illegal drug use and cannabis in the Sunset and in San Francisco. Regardless of what you may think about California law, both illegal drug use and cannabis use, sale, possession, and growing remain illegal under federal law. So because of that, because I am an attorney and my oath is to the Constitution of the United States of America, those two activities remain technically illegal in California, despite the voters voting for medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. I cannot support a cannabis dispensary in the district or anywhere in San Francisco, and I certainly don't support illegal drug injection sites. This is not what San Francisco should be about. Why are we rolling out the red carpet for drug abusers and painting all of the merchant zones with red zones. This is not what we should be doing. Thank you very much. Mr. Kim? Um, so like uh, many of the people who spoke before me said, cannabis is now legal in the state of California and in San Francisco. Um, and we have plenty of uh, older individuals or people who um, have a mobility issues or other kinds of uh, mental issues that actually require uh, medical marijuana. And I would rather not stand between them and the accessibility of uh, medical marijuana. That said, uh, I do know the, the gentrification effects that cannabis dispensaries can have. Uh, that was uh, the reasoning why they proposed a blanket ban on marijuana in Chinatown. And, uh, uh, that's the thing that we don't need, is we don't need um, cannabis dispensaries attracting uh, all kinds of tourists and uh, you know, increasing property values for people who just want to be able to live and not be displaced from their apartments. Thank you very much. Mr. Marr? Um, some of you may have seen the Examiner article that came out this week that sort of highlighted my position on cannabis dispensaries in the sunset. Um, I, you know, I, I, I my basic position is that the dispensaries, that the three dispensaries that have been proposed so far in our neighborhood, have been strongly opposed by by the by neighbors. So that indicates to me that they were not good fits for those locations, and the project sponsors did not win the trust of the community. Um, and for any future cannabis proposal, dispensary proposal in the neighborhood, I'm committed to listening to the community and ensuring that they have a voice in the decisions. And it's really the responsibility of the project sponsor to be able to convince us, you know, the neighbors that they're gonna be a responsible business and a good fit. If not, you know, I would oppose them. Um, but taking that a step further though, one of my first priorities if elected would be to convene a working group, a, a Sunset District cannabis uh, working group that would bring together um, the, the different perspectives on the issue within the Sunset District um, to, to foster more understanding, um, to find common ground, and, and to sort of collectively develop the most appropriate way to regulate cannabis dispensaries in our neighborhood on, on this issue, which has been so divisive in our neighborhood and, and in many other places around the city. 
Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil? So, I mean, as a parent and a teacher, this, I, I really want to do everything I can to prevent drugs from getting into the hands of our young people. I mean, one of the things to think about drug addiction, and it really is awful, um, is to think of it as a, a, a symptom of other problems. And there, those are, that's a very complicated public health debate. But at least you could do, from a supervisor's perspective, at the least you could do is make it very clear that we are against drugs. And you know, it's worth saying that if, you're, if you want to open up a new business, that's great. You need to be a good neighbor. And the dramatic failure of some of these cannabis dispensaries to get any public support from the sunset, it's clear that they are not good neighbors. They're here just to make a buck, and I don't want to be used. I want to support my community. Same thing goes for um, the outreach efforts that we do have as a city. Um, one of the problems is all of our services, especially our uh, counter drug efforts, are concentrated in the Tenderloin, in the south of market areas, and that makes sense, but we need support too. We need a supervisor who understands our district, who knows where the needles are, where the people are, are publicly using drugs, and where the city needs to intervene. Thank you very much. The next question, we're going to go to Mr. Wynn, and it's a citywide question. So what is your view on San Francisco's sanctuary city status? Yeah, I, I do believe that, that we do need to protect our immigrant community. I was Angela Aliota's West Side Field Director for the last month of her campaign for mayor. But I also abstained from, from being there at the press conferences where she organized um, and introduced new legislation for convicts, uh, convicted felons. So for myself, I, I do believe that, that we need to protect our sanctuary city law, and I do believe that, that our elected officials need to stand by the, the communities and also not work with ICE um, in terms of any type of communication. Um, and it, again, it changes from specific issue um, for each of these individuals, but I do believe that it's important to protect the integrity of our, our immigrant community. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? I served on the Immigrant Rights Commission for the city and county of San Francisco, and it's a strong hero for sanctuary city laws, for people coming from countries and they're seeking asylum from repressive governments. But that does not mean that we want to harbor violent criminals that have been arrested for very violent crimes. And we know what happened in Contra Costa County when they separated themselves from ICE. It ended up having these criminals or arrested uh, perpetrators have to go to Colorado, far away from their families. So it ended up backfiring. So we just have to be reasonable and think of what common sense laws are gonna protect the people and they need to uh, be a, accountable just the way a normal citizen would if they were arrested for a, a violent crime. Thank you very much. Ms. Bassan. There is a difference between legal immigration and illegal immigration. As an attorney, I completely support legal immigration. We have a federal immigration law that has been on the books since about 1952. If you want to come to America as a refugee or as an asylee seeking asylum for, on whatever grounds, you are more than welcome to do so. You can enter at any port of entry, such as an airport or a seaport, and you can ask for asylum once your foot touches the ground. Illegal immigration is a completely different issue. I do not support it. I do not support sanctuary city. I do not support sanctuary state. We hear the claims that the community needs to be protected. This is completely anecdotal. I challenge one person to come to me with an actual case of somebody who went to the police because they were victimized and they were protected by sanctuary city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kim? Uh, we have a thriving immigrant population in San Francisco. Uh, a lot of what San Francisco is known for is its diversity, and a lot of that uh, has been brought by immigrants. So I stand in strong support of our sanctuary city status. 
Um, and if we have convicts or felons who are um, not um, legal immigrants, uh, you know, we don't need ICE to tell us that. We have our own due process system in San Francisco, and we don't need people to strip away rights from people just because they didn't have the means to come here on a thousand dollar visa. Um, sanctuary laws are, are protecting uh, people from regressive uh, actions and uh, I, can't, I can't oppose them and I also opposed Angela Aliotto's um, proposed measure against the sanctuary laws. Thank you very much. Mr. Marr? As a son of immigrants and a longtime community leader in, in our immigrant communities here in San Francisco and the Bay Area, um, this issue is, is deeply personal to me. Um, um, I, I fully support our sanctuary city law, and I think that it's very important um, in the current political climate when, um, you know, the, the, on a national level, the Trump administration is really using immigrants as a foil and targets um, and whipping up a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment um, that is not, that's creating a divisive atmosphere both nationally and here locally. So if elected, I will be a strong advocate um, for all, all of our communities, but particularly um, immigrants here in the Sunset District and, and in our city and protecting their rights. Um, and, and this is sort of building off of my decades of work, you know, um, organizing and supporting immigrant communities. I was the executive director of the Chinese Progressive Association for 15 years, um, supporting immigrant families to, to improve their living and working conditions. Um, I also served as the, the director of the Northern California Citizenship Project, which um, encouraged voter registration and political participation of immigrants in the region. So this is a very important issue to me, and I would strongly support and protect Thank our immigrants. Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil? Um, I love the sunset and I love the city because of its diversity and immigration is a big part of that. I would just echo everything Mr. Marr said. Um, I think that it's important to remember that part of Sanctuary City is about due process. Um, it's about people who are convicted of violent felonies. Yeah, then they can be processed. I mean, that's President Obama did that. I mean, that's what we're talking about. What, what people are talking about is if you're just picked up suspected of something, and then you're carted off to ICE. That's not the job of our police. If you're a victim of domestic abuse, if you need help from the police, if you want to help inform the police and solve a crime, you should feel comfortable going to the police and know that they're not going to lock you up because of your immigration status. I do think that there is some reasonability, though, that needs to be brought into the conversation, that just because we're fighting uh, Donald Trump and standing for social justice, there are some places where there are shades of gray. One is, for example, our participation in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. There are ways, right now we are not part of that. That's why the SFPD had no idea what was happening on when we were almost attacked at Pier 39. I think it's very important that we find ways to cooperate where it makes sense, to hold to our values when it's important to us, because it is important to what it means okay. to be a San Franciscan, and to find a reasonable way to protect due process and immigrants. Thank you very much, and Mr. Murphy? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the talk about Sanctuary City misses the political context in which we'll, which the conversation comes from. Um, a funny thing happened on the way to the mayor's office. Um, Angela Aliotto wasn't quite getting the attention she thought she deserved. And she was the author of the sanctuary city policy. So she staged a press conference and said, I want to close this loophole. Um, and actually sent a ballot measure to uh, elections, which was terrible. It would have allowed any, any law enforcement officer to pick anybody off the street and hand them over to ICE which sounds a lot like profiling, which sounds counter to San Francisco values. Later, she fixed it once we, once we called her out on it and said, you're a civil rights lawyer, you shouldn't have done this. Um, we have due process in effect. Um, we have a sanctuary city policy. I believe it is correct. I believe that we should support those, including those who the border crossed, some of whom are my youngest students um, at SFUSD. Thank you very much. Now we're going to talk about an issue that not only affects the sunset, but affects the citywide. Um, over the last couple of years, through to a, many um, reasons, we've had a, seen an increase in wildfires around the state. And we, the probability of us suffering a significant earthquake here in San Francisco, um, if you listen to the news, is imminent. Uh, what are your views on needs for new earthquake-resistant fire hydrant systems or for 
increasing or improving our infrastructure to address that particular fact of life here in the city. And we're going to start with Mr. Tom. Thank you for that question. Right now, our AWSS water system was built in 1913. Only the northeast corner of San Francisco has enough fire protection to take care of itself. The entire west side is not protected. The last big main runs through 19th Avenue and it serves the areas east of there. If there was an earthquake, there would be 100 fires that break out on the west side and we don't have the infrastructure. We have 32 cisterns. There's one on the corner of my block. They have those brick circles around it. You need two pumps, one to pump the water out and another one to pump it into the fire. We only have six hook and ladder trucks. That's not nearly enough. Six fires can be put, put out, or three fires can be put out, and we could have 100 break out here. We need to improve the systems so that we can include water coming from the ocean and Lake Merced. So I encourage getting the infrastructure rapidly fixed up. Thank you very much. Ms. Bassan. Thank you. Mr. Tom and I were at a forum just a few nights ago where we went over all of this about the AWSS, which is the Auxiliary Water Supply System. So I echo everything that Mr. Tom said. I'm in complete agreement with him. But I would piggyback on what he said, and I would add this. This issue about an earthquake happening imminently, as Maxine said, and the resulting fires is an extremely good reason not to increase building density, not to have four and five and six story buildings in the sunset on any corridor, transit or otherwise. It's also a good argument not to encourage accessory dwelling units because we're just talking about increasing density of population. And when the big earthquake comes, we are not going to have enough food or water. And I hope that you're not going to rely on your government to take care of you and that you are all familiar with 72hour.com because you will need to take care of yourselves. So these are good reasons to immediately try to improve the AWSS and to take Thank the jurisdiction you. back from the PUC and get Thank it back you. to the fire department who is the Thank expert on this Thank issue. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Mr. Kim? Um, so it's clear that it's not just our uh, emergency infrastructure that's outdated. We have a lot of uh, public service uh, infrastructure that needs replacing. We have uh, you know, storm drains that go straight out to the bay or to the ocean, and uh, we have our drinking water hooked up to irrigation systems. Um, it's clear that the entire water infrastructure needs an overhaul, and, uh, and that becomes even more dire as uh, the risk of a major geological event uh, threatens us. And, you know, that might happen at any moment. So uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Tom that we need, we need an overhaul of that system. Thank you very much. And Mr. Marr? Yeah, I, I also agree with my colleagues that um, um, upgrading our, our water um, system and, and, and really, really more seriously preparing for um, um, emergencies like um, earthquakes, fires, or even impacts of climate change, you know, us being here on, on the, the western edge of the city are critically important for the Sunset District. And um, I would also add that um, I think we, we need to, we also need to build more um, neighborhood-based um, um, structures um, for, to, to respond um, in, the, in the case of an emergency. Um, and, and I would like to see us sort of building off of the, the, the watch of the neighborhood watch system that SF SAFE, Safe has been facilitating, um, to, but that's been more around public safety issues. So we can and, and developing uh, neighbor like block neighborhood um, emergency preparedness groups where our neighbors are working together to, to prepare for for all types of emergencies that we know are going to hit us, um, be hitting the Sunset District in our city in the coming years. Thank you very much, and Mr. McNeil. Uh, I definitely would approach. Uh, I favor the community approach. I am a NERT. You can look that up, what that means. Um, and I do think that the AWSS needs uh, repairing, and I would lo love to work with Supervisor Fewer on this because the west side of town really is not prepared for a major emergency, and we need to do something about that. But generally, I also think this has to do with uh, the way we treat infrastructure in the city. 
Uh, we do a terrible job. Uh, Governing Magazine has given us a C minus. We're one of the only municipalities in the country with a C minus. And there are some things that we need to do, and I think I mentioned this earlier, about thinking about policy in the long term. Uh, politicians want to fix something and get their name on something and pass a bill or an ordinance or a resolution or name the day after themselves or whatever, but what, what results is that they're not thinking 20 years down the line when maintenance costs really are the problem. We've got $2.4 billion in maintenance fees that have been identified that are current. And one of the solutions there, we could be moving towards a more real estate uh, developed model where the maintenance costs are worked into the project of capital improvements. Uh, the GSA at the federal level does this, and I think it's something that San Francisco could easily implement for practical Thank policy you. solutions on infrastructure. Thank you very much. And Mr. Murphy? Yeah, we need to take a close look at, at all of our water infrastructure projects in the sunset, not just the emergency systems, but our, our delivery system, which is mixing toxic potable, toxic groundwater into our potable supply. Um, also our, our sewer systems, our combined sewer systems, which every time it rains dumps uh, raw sewage into, into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, these are not the hallmarks of a green city, not the hallmarks of a future focused government. Um, in terms of readiness for an, an emergency, I believe that you know, our first responders do need our support. Um, our fire department, luckily I live down the street and around the corner from a fire uh, station. I'm thankful for that. Um, uh, instead of show pony projects, we need to uh, come together and, and support our first responders. That's the most significant way. And take, and take, the, uh, take, take away from the PUC, which is an enterprise agency, the ability to dictate which infrastructure is prioritized. Thank you so much. And Mr. Wynn? I think we could all agree that the climate change is real. And I, I do the, echo the sentiment of all my, my colleagues over here next to me uh, in regards to um, their concern for the west side in the city. Um, I, I am supportive of, of the improvements of the seawall and the master plan that's happening down at um, Ocean Beach to protect our seawall as well. Water wars, I mean, they're coming. I mean, quite frankly, you know, we really have to improve our uh, nerd training as well and uh, the infrastructure. And that includes working with PG&E uh, with, with their lines out here, which I think are super archaic and I think they need to improve that, those systems as well. And disaster preparedness, um, the big one is coming, so we certainly need to uh, review all our processes and ensure that everything is correct and in order. Thank you very much. Okay, and our next question, one of the major industry, if not the major industry in San Francisco is tourism. Um, and one issue that we're having now, and if you walk the streets of San Francisco, you probably see broken glass as you're walking along the streets. So the question is, do you believe there should be harsher, harsher criminal penalties for crimes such as break-ins? Or do you feel there's another way we can address this issue to reduce this type of crime? And we're going to start with Ms. Bassan. Proposition 47, which was a California state initiative ballot, has been a disaster because it reduced the category of car break-ins from a felony to a misdemeanor, which has simply encouraged the criminal element. That's why car break-ins have skyrocketed to 30,000 last year. And the criminals, a lot of them are coming from outside of the jurisdiction of San Francisco. They take BART over. And they know where to target tourists. This sends a sorry message to the rest of the world that San Francisco cannot protect tourists when they come here. I do favor harsher penalties for criminals. I think Proposition 47 should be overturned and that these crimes should be reclassified as the felonies that they were originally. And I think that the city could do a much better job in terms of having some sort of ambassador program fully staffed at all tourist sites 24-7 to protect the tourists. Thank you very much. Mr. Kim? Um, I'm not a fan of uh, increased penalties being a deterrent to crime. Uh, part, of, part of that is because if we're not even catching the criminals, 
Uh, how are we, why would the penalty matter to them? Um, and the problem is a lot of our police officers are wasting their time downtown uh, busting the homeless when they should be patrolling uh, the streets in every neighborhood. Um, and that's, that's what we need. We need more police presence. We need police engagement with the community. Uh, if, if the officer knows the, uh, the neighborhood, then the people in the neighborhood are less likely to commit a crime because they know their, their authority figure. Uh, and uh, the, the more we can engage our, our police with the community, the, the less likely they are to also be perceived as um, a threat of violence and more as a community leader. And that's what we need, just better community, community leadership overall to uh, watch over our streets uh, in a joint effort. Thank you, Mr. Marr. Um, <clears throat> I work in, down in Civic Center and kind of at ground zero of, of the, these pro the crime problems, and I've had my car break, broken into a number of times, so um, I certainly would agree that um, we need to do a much better job of addressing um, auto burglaries in our city. Um, and um, one, one idea that I have that I would, would like to push for is the creation of a citywide um, auto burglary um, unit that is just focused on it citywide. Because right now, um, there's, there's staff from the different um, district stations that are, that are focused on the issue. So if we have a, a district-wide um, auto, auto burglary unit that, that could develop a more comprehensive strategic approach to the problem, it would also free up our district um, station staff to focus on the neighborhood and district issues. Um, beyond that, you know, I just wanted to say um, on public safety overall, you know, we all deserve to feel safe in our homes and our neighborhoods without fear of crime disrupting our communities. Um, and I, I, for the Sunset District, I would really prioritize more community policing strategies where um, that build trust between the police officers and our communities they serve and focus on Thank foot you. patrols and, and hiring more multilingual staff. Thank you very much. And Mr. McNeil? Um, the, the first place I lived in District 4 was across from Golden Gate Park, and my car has been broken into four times just there, and sometimes even with the child seat in there, and there's a special place in hell for someone who breaks into a car that has a kid's seat, but whatever, that's another thing. Um, I am glad that the, the SFPD has started having a uh, district focus on this, and we actually have seen a decrease in property crime like that with police staffing. So one obvious place to start that would differentiate me from other members of the current Board of Supervisors is I'm in favor of full police staffing. Um, we actually uh, technically are at full police staffing right now, except for that was based on levels designed in 1994. So I think we should increase it. I'm proud to have the Police, Associ uh, police Officers Association Union endorsement. Um, and there are other things that we can do, because like Ms. Bassan said, there is an organized crime to this. They, the, most of the car break-ins are being done by people who do this again and again and again, and our DA does need to be held accountable because if you, wherever you are on Prop 47 aside, if you're missing that someone has priors and someone's part of a crime ring like this, you're missing the point. We need to punish people who are uh, serial Thank car breakers. Into the Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy? Um, I believe in community-based policing, not broken windows policing. Uh, stable communities are safe communities. My, my street used to have 40 families on it, 40 families. Now there's like six. Um, Airbnb complaints on both ends of the street. Uh, so we need to stabilize our communities. And I, I earlier mentioned a number of ways we could do that. Uh, in terms of tourism, uh, I think what we're headed toward is another sort of generia with little reservations, pockets of San Francisco that's recognizable like the uh, Painted Ladies and the Golden Gate Bridge. I'd like to preserve the entire city, the unique, rich fabric of our neighborhoods. And, and, and community-based policing, there used to be beat cops in, uh, in uh, North Beach who looked like beat cops. Um, I'd like to see more of those characters on our streets. Uh, in terms of auto break-ins, I don't believe that uh, the, the, they dropped 40% in the last, in the last uh, count. It's dog whistle Thank politics. Thank you very much. Mr. Wynn? Yeah, the tourist industry is a big industry in, this, the, um, in the city. And what, what I notice is tourists, they, they look at the fact that we, we have dirty streets. Um, the homeless issue is not a purported 10,000 homeless issue. It's more of a 15,000 homeless person issue. We're losing conventions um, as well. 
but I'm more concerned about our residents and the protection of our residents and, and the safety of our res residents. We have 30,000 break-ins um, of, of property crimes a year, and I think since uh, in the last couple of years, we only had 13 convictions. That's unacceptable. Um, and while SFPD talks about a task force um, and de decreasing those numbers, I think we could do a lot better. I, I do support um, increased police beats and the walking of beats, and then I also support um, police staffing to the mandated level as well. So I do agree with Trevor in that capacity. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? I know we have a lot of tourists in San Francisco, but I don't see them coming to like Quintara or Yorba to look around. What I see is people coming out to the sunset thinking it's an easy pickings place because people don't complain and they're breaking into cars out here and that is more of a concern to the residents. I started a safe neighborhood watch group that gave people more confidence to report crimes and now we have online something called Next Door that gives people an awareness of the crimes that are going on. I would like to see uh, individual cameras and merchant cameras linked to the police system and see more community policing. Um, and if the, as it was mentioned earlier, full police staff goes from 1,600 to 2,000, that would help increase our safety here. Public safety is paramount for residents and families in the sunset. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of the hot topic issues this year has been campaign financing. So we're going to ask the question, or the question was asked, I guess, how will you be funding your campaign and what's your philosophy, philosophy on campaign financing? And we're going to start with Mr. Kim. Uh, we have a lot of uh, dark money in politics, even in San Francisco, where we have probably some of the stronger uh, campaign finance law. Um, and you know, even though we're limited to $500 per donation, somehow we have candidates who come in with you know, half a million. Um, I'd like to see more public financing available uh, at a lower level, uh, but on top of that, um, you know, I would like to see more accountability coming from the Ethics Commission to, to track where these uh, donations are coming from. Uh, personally, I have a very uh, people-based campaign, so I'm not taking any corporate uh, dollars uh, in my campaign at all. Thank you very much. And Mr. Marr? Um, I, I'm proud to have qualified for the, the city's public financing matching program, and, and through that I've agreed to a, a voluntary spending cap of $250,000, um, and I'm able to get um, city matching funds for my campaign. Um, and, and by qualifying, it really we've been able to show that that um, I or my campaign or I have a, have broad based support um, in the neighborhood and the city from a large range of, of small individual donors. Um, so that's that's a key part of my campaign. Um, I, I do want to say though that um, the city's public financing program does need to be looked at and and and, and how it's being implemented because I, I do think it you know the fact that a couple, a number of candidates, my colleagues, you know, were not able to qualify for public financing. You know, is it was not a good was a was very problematic, and and a lot of it was because of the the poor way that the program's been implemented. Um, so, yeah. So I I, I guess I, I would really support efforts to improve our city's public financing program and make sure all candidates are able to to be able to to have the, the necessary information to apply. Thank you very much, and Mr. McNeil. Um, there is too much money in San Francisco politics. Full stop. Period. Um, I'm the only one up here who has run for office before. I was elected to the Democratic County Central Committee when I was 24 in 2006. And I did it by working hard. I did it through pluck. And I really think that uh, there is a diminishing level of returns when it comes to money in politics. I don't know how many mailers you got in the last mayoral election, but I don't know how convincing those are. Right? Maybe one, like, hey, here, here's who I am, consider voting for me. The inundation of special groups and 
democratic clubs that only exist to prop up their person, that kind of thing I think is bad for San Francisco politics. I'm, I'm naive, I like politics. I think politics is a great chance to come together and learn from voters and be represented and do wonderful things for the, your community. It's almost like community service. But the amount of money that gets spent in politics is ridiculous. I'm gonna be very proud to run a completely grassroots campaign. I'm not spending money on things that aren't necessary. I'm just gonna be knocking on your door with you know, a door hanger, but that's it. Thank you very much, and Mr. Murphy? Yeah, our previous supervisor took $200,000 from developers and, and uh, elite public interests who uh, were associated with the real estate industry. That's when, in her first campaign. In her second campaign, she ran unopposed and took $100,000 from the same people. Um, th that money obviously didn't buy votes. It bought access. Um, I think it, it, it behooves voters to be informed and, and look at where the money's coming from in campaigns. Um, the one who's not here is going to be well funded. Um, my, so my colleague, Mr. Marr, um, has a not-for-profit and can tap that network for donations. My donations come from friends, family, neighbors, people who support me. And I have some pluck too. I actually ran for uh, Green Party County Council. It's an elected position. And, and that's, it's significant that I was able to do so resourcefully without, without having to meet with a developer and, and be visited by the FBI. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Mr. Wynn? We've seen how, how recently the mayoral race uh, went. It got dirty towards the end. Um, with, with certain candidates not signing pledges of, of accepting independent expenditures. Um, this is a supervisorial race. It's a smaller race, 70,000 people. You know, I, I, w I did qualify for public financing, but the Ethics Commission makes it very difficult uh, to, to meet certain thresholds. And because of that, you're not playing with house money and, and city money um, and being given an opportunity to compete competitively. I've run political campaigns in the city um, and nonprofit campaigns in the city for the last 17 years. So I understand what it takes to connect with people and, and work on a grassroots level, meeting every single person out here. There's 70,000 people out here. Um, the, the candidate with the most amount of money and the most amount of support and endorsements don't ne doesn't necessarily win. Um, it's about pounding the pavement and going door to door. So in that capacity, I look forward to the next 58 days. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom. I'm in the same boat as many of my other colleagues here. I am not going to get public financing, and I'm not depending on it. I think that money could be better spent on city services. I'm going to go the old-fashioned way, meeting people in the community. I'm getting my fundraising from other uh, constituents, neighbors, residents, family, and I'm going to work the old-fashioned way, uh, meeting people at meet and greets, door knocking, calling you if you don't mind. So uh, I'll see, look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you very much, and Ms. Bassan. This is my first campaign. I am not a professional politician. I have never done this before. So the first thing I did was get some how-to books. And I learned right away that because I was due to politics, I had no name recognition. And the advice was, go door to door. Knock on everyone's door and introduce yourself. And that is exactly what I have been doing. I am very proud to say that I have covered many of the precincts already and have already met many of you, either in person or by the door hanger that I left for you. I am also very happy to report that I have gotten many contributions from friends and family all across the United States, and I believe I am running neck and neck with Mr. Marr in terms of funding. I am not going to be, get, uh, be getting public financing, so I am doing this from my house. That's my campaign headquarters. I have no office. I have no professional staff. I am not wasting any money. And if I were your supervisor, I wouldn't waste your money either. I am very frugal, and that's Thank how I am running my campaign. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this will be our last question. Um, and <clears throat> I think it will give us a more 
we've gotten an idea of how the candidates think and, and who they are, but this will give us even more of an idea. So could you, candidates, and we're going to start with Mr. Marr, could you give us your vision for the city and for the Sunset District? And could you tell us in light of what programs or projects you've worked on in the district or in the city to make it a better place? So we're going to start with Mr. Marr. I, I moved to San Francisco um, actually 30 years ago um, as a young person just after graduating from UC Berkeley. Um, and then my, my wife and I moved to the Sunset District 13 years ago, as I said, to raise my daughter here. Um, but um, a lot of what attracted me to, to this great city um, as a young person 30 years ago and to the family-friendly Sunset District 13 years ago really feels at risk of, of being radically changed right now um, due to the, the affordability crisis and sort of the dramatic economic changes that are playing out in our city. So I'm really, that this is what really motivated, motivated me to, to shift from being a, um, a community leader and a nonprofit ex executive director for the past decades to wanting to, to seek um, a, a, a public leadership position, you know, a supervisor here in District 4. And it's really to um, ensure that San Francisco can continue be, to be a place where anyone, um, regardless of income or social condition, is able to um, continue to live, to work, to raise a family, to retire with dignity. Um, and, and, also, and this is also why I've been working on these issues, again, as, a, as, a, as an organizer and community leader for over 25 years. Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil? So my, my vision of the sunset and the city is a little nostalgic because I love the sunset. It's where I learned how to ice skate. I used to play soccer on the fields behind here, right? The sunset's where I brought my uh, three children home from the hospital. And I want them to be able to live here if they choose. I mean, that's, it seems like such a simple threshold, but that really is at the heart of, I think, all of my sort of passion and policies. Um, you know, I think this, we, we need to have strong communities. I we used to be on the board of the Inner Sunset Park Neighborhood Association. Um, I think we need to have uh, people with deep roots here. I, my, my first teaching job was at Lawton. Um, and I also think that understanding how government works is important. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm running a grassroots campaign. I am an outsider. I don't work in City Hall, but I do have experience in politics. I do have experience representing District 4 in City Hall. And so I think that there is a level of which that my, my biography, my background, my hopes for my family's future, and my uh, skill set and resume are really going to make me a strong supervisor if I'm lucky enough to get elected. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Murphy? Yeah, my, my vision is a, for the city is uh, typical of somebody who's invested in ecology, um, typical of someone who has San Francisco values. Uh, it's a seven-generation vision. Uh, right now, our city is being sold out to the highest bidder. Um, land use economics is the crisis that we face, not an affordability crisis, land use economics. Um, this is where I surf. This is where I run. This is where my son and I play basketball. I envisioned a future for us um, in which he could return to this neighborhood. Um, I love it here. It's the only, this is the dream that I've had, and I've lived here for, uh, in San Francisco for over 20 years. Um, I don't see a future here for myself. I don't see a future here for my son. I do not see a future here for the, for the SFUSD's youngest students, unless we take it back. We need an independent, hard-nosed legislator who's not connected to City Hall, who's not connected to the party machine, and I'll be that legislator. Thank you very much. Mr. Wynn? Uh, San Francisco is a, um, is a world-class city with third-world problems. <laughs> Bureaucrats love to have excuses in the city. And um, I grew up here as a native uh, of the Sunset, went to Holy Name, went to SI. I've seen a lot of changes out here. I remember there were bagel shops out here on Noriega Street, and I grew up in, when it was Italian and Irish. Progressively, it became Asian Pacific Islander out here. It's a different San Francisco now. It's always been a changing San Francisco. But we've got to fight for the everyday people in San Francisco, which we're losing. Um, middle class families can't afford to live here anymore. And I want to be a part of leading San Francisco to ensure that we are still diverse. The tech sector can't continue to have um, tax breaks. We can't continue to give breaks to Lyft and Uber. And uh, hopefully, we could build a better San Francisco with everybody involved. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom? My family first came to San Francisco in 1851. 
I'm born in San Francisco, I'm a native. I live here and I moved here after Berkeley because I wanted to come back to the city that I called home, the place that I love. I met my wife here, who's also a San Francisco native, and our kids were born here. We live in the sunset and attend Lawton School here in the sunset. I'm hoping that they can stay here for another generation and have the life that we've had the privilege to living in this city, but it's looking more difficult all the time. What have I done in this neighborhood because I love it so much? I, I founded a group that rebuilt the playground that's become a, a community center, also uh, in terms of the library that's around there. And in the, in the city, I've served on three commissions. I might be the only candidate that's done so, the Immigrant Rights Commission, the Taxi Commission, which deals with transportation issues, and two terms on the Assessment Appeals Board. I have the experience in City Hall, and I currently work for the city as a city auditor. I understand the operations very well. Thank I look you. forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bassan? My vision for San Francisco is this. I used to be proud to tell people I was from San Francisco, and now I'm embarrassed. I don't want it to be known. I would like to go back to the way it was when I can be proud to say I'm from San Francisco. I'm from a world-class city. I invite you to come. You will have a wonderful time here. But as it is now, it's a cesspool. It's disgusting, and it's filthy, and it's dangerous. And if I am supervisor, I am going to vote no on the policies that keep perpetuating those problems and are keeping us downtrodden. Do you want to be afraid to go downtown? I'm tired of having to wear combat boots when I go to Civic Center because I don't know what I'm going to step in or on. This is my vision, to make things right, to bring it back where it's clean and beautiful. I've spent my entire career fighting for my clients, and if I'm elected supervisor, I will fight for you and your quality of life. Thank you very much. And Mr. Kim. Uh, I moved to the Bay Area 10 years ago uh, from the Chicago area. I also went to University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and growing up in the Midwest, uh, it's, it's hard to uh, fit in um, when, when you're not, uh, you know, your typical Midwest cookie cutter person. Um, but I found a home here in the Bay Area, here in San Francisco, and it's because of the diversity that, that I feel it's home. And uh, we're, we're in trouble of losing that diversity to uh, gentrification and uh, homogenous tech bro culture. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's our least privileged people who are being forced out. And those are the people I want to see uh, stay. I want to see uh, a place for, where everyone can live, not just rich people, and that everyone has a home, uh, and people are paid uh, wages that can fulfill a reasonable living cost. Uh, and it might be a pipe dream, but uh, that's what I'm going to fight for. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gen gentlemen, we come to the candidate's closing statements. But let me first remind you that if you are not registered to vote, <laughs> please do so right away and urge others you know to register also. If you've moved, you'll need to re-register again at your new address. We will do, okay, now I've said my thing. Now I've said my thing. Thank you very much. Um, we will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order and remember that you have one minute. So we're gonna start with Mr. Tom with closing statements. Thank you. I love this city and I love San Francisco and the sunset is my home. I'm like you, I'm a family here, I'm raising my family and we have multi-generational deep roots. I wanna see it so that seniors have activities to do, young children and the next generation that two worker families can have services where they can have activities enriching for their kids while they're at school and after school. These are just the common sense things that I'm looking for for all of us, the residents. My door is always open. I wanna know what your needs and concerns are because those are my needs. Those are the needs of the community and I hope to serve you well. Thank you. Thank you very much.
much. Mr. Wen. As a Sunset native and, and community advocate and organizer, uh, I've attended hundred, uh, hundreds of community meetings. I, I know who you are. I know where you live, um, where you eat. This is, this is just, we are the sunset. And quite frankly, we're fighting for the soul of San Francisco. I've, for years, 20 years or so, been a consultant and campaign manager, worked my way up as, as a field director, and had an opportunity to meet Bill Clinton and, and Obama, and was fortunate enough to, uh, to learn from, from a lot of great individuals and leaders in, in San Francisco, including Gavin Newsom and uh, Fiona Ma as her field director, and managed Ron Dudum's campaign for supervisor. We all remember what happened in the Sunset District uh, with the whole edu and res the residency issue. So I hope to lead the Sunset in, in a very positive way and connect and work with both moderates and pro progressives because I worked on both campaigns and both sides of the ledger. And hopefully I'm a uniter in that capacity. So I look forward to meeting everybody door to door. And uh, please you. take a look at my website, twanforsunset.com. Thank you very much. And it'll be all for Twan and Twan for All. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Yeah, as we really need to, to step back from our series of appointed incumbent supervisors in the sunset, um, we've been abandoned, as I said, to city hall politics for so long, most of the residents here are checked out. They don't want to vote. Um, I, as supervisor, will operate under a, a, new, a new model for transparency in governance. You'll know what my positions are before I vote. You'll have the opportunity to provide input. I will hear you. I will hear you at informal com community advisory boards, which I will stage. Right now, we don't have the budget for that, but I'll do it anyway. Um, I, will, I will hear your input into the planning process so that together we can, we can help temper the problems that we have with big money in real estate and tech, which, which place our community at risk at risk for being turned into another genaria. I don't want to see that happen. I will not allow it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil. Um, the most important question to ask us is why we're running for office. And I think most of us would probably say the same thing. We love San Francisco, we like helping people, and we care about the issues. And my love for San Francisco is deep. I am a native San Franciscan. Um, I do like helping people, it's not just a line. I'm a public school teacher. I don't do it for the money and the fame. I do it because I like being of service. And I also like being of service outside of the classroom. That's why, you know, when Katie Tang wants uh, somebody to sit on a community advisory board, I, I raise my hand, I show up, I do the work. And when it comes to caring about these issues, I mean, it's, it might be corny, but I have three kids under four. Uh, public safety isn't an abstract idea for me. Clean streets isn't an abstract idea for me. Quality schools, innovative government, uh, and of course affordability aren't abstract to me. Um, I really care about the sunset, I really care about the city, and I hope that you consider voting for me for one of your three votes. Um, I have been endorsed by people like uh, Fiona Maha and Vicki Hennessy, but I've also been endorsed by community leaders like uh, Doug Chan and uh, Ron Dudum. So I think I am uh, of the sunset, I am of San Francisco, and I would be very honored to receive your vote. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Marr. So again, I've, I've been a community leader and a nonprofit executive director for over 25 years in the city. Um, I've, I've led um, efforts to create policy and, and on, on issues of importance to working people, families, seniors, and students. Um, I was a leader in the campaign to save City College from closure and, and to make it tuition free for all San Francisco residents. I've, I've led efforts to create good jobs for San Francisco residents in the, in the hosp hospitality and healthcare sectors, and I've also um, created policy and led efforts to expand services for seniors and people with disabilities, including creating the Support at Home program. So I'm bringing my decades of experience to, to help address the critical issues facing our neighborhood and our city. But for me, this is personal. Um, I think about my daughter, like, like some of my colleagues here, and whether she and her friends will, will be able to afford to live in the city that they're being raised in. Um, I also think about my daughter coming to visit me at my office at the Hotel Workers Union Hall in the Tenderloin, stepping over needles and waste on the, on the sidewalks and so many of our community members living on the streets. Um, in the center of, of such innovation and wealth, I believe we can solve the, these critical issues and I would bring the leadership experience to be able to, to, to tackle that on day one. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you very much. Mr. Kim. Uh, so, so somehow, out of all the candidates that are qualified, uh, I've been in this race the longest. Um, you know, even though I don't have as illustrious a, a work history as uh, many of these fine individuals, um, somehow Mike Murphy and I have been the only two who uh, decide to challenge the incumbent uh, and work toward changing the status quo. Uh, because we've had a history of supervisors and uh, administrations that uh, give tax breaks to big tech and to uh, the real estate developers. And, you know, that, that needs to stop. We need to cut, cut the money out of uh, San Francisco's politics and uh, give power back to the people. And that, that's what we're standing for. And, um, you know, w we have a ranked choice voting system, so it doesn't even have to be vote for your favorite. Vote for your three favorite who, who will give your voice uh, back, like, put your voice back in City Hall. Thank you very much. And Ms. Bassan? I've lived in San Francisco since 1960, and I have been a homeowner with my husband in the sunset on Noriega Street for 25 years. You've sat here today, thank you very much, and you've heard my answers. I have answered every question very directly. You know my opinions, and you know where I stand on the issues. And I have not said what I think will get me votes, but what I believe. And you know now what I believe. I'm a fighter. I have been all my life. I've had adversities in childhood. I worked my way through high school, college, and law school in union jobs, local too. And in my career as a lawyer, I have fought for each and every client. I'm also a person who helps people by being a teacher, ESL. I am the best voice for District 4. I am a strong voice, I'm a tough negotiator, I am not a puppet, and I am not a pushover. You know that I will put your interests first at City Hall. I will bring a balance to the Board of Supervisors and common sense to City Hall. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I ask all of you, please give a great round of applause to all these persons who want to be a representative in District 4. And now on, behalf, now on behalf of myself, the Sunset Parkside Education and Action Committee, Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods, and the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, our thanks to the candidates for participating. And unfortunately, and you might have noticed that there was one empty chair, um, Ms. Jessica Ho, unfortunately, could not attend this morning, although I'm sure she, she probably wanted to. But thanks to each of you for taking time to inform yourself about your choices on November 6th. Have a great rest of your Saturday. Go home safely. Have a good time. Enjoy. Thank you very much.